Have you ever heard of Lu uh, Momolti's pizza? It's a no, big not, thing. No, yeah. No, not, yeah. 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 yeah, you've heard of it? Yeah, all right, it's 10.30, everybody. Good morning. Order it online. Welcome to all of you uh, who are here. Welcome to you who are online and on YouTube. I have a message today that I've been working on for at least two months. We also have a sermonette today. The message I'm working on today, if you put it to practice, if you dare to put to practice, it can change your life in a miraculous way. So pay close, close attention. In fact, I've got so much to cover today, I may not even finish it all, and I'm not going to hurry it up, too. If I don't finish it, I'll finish it next week, perhaps. But this is an extremely important message today. And what I'm going to be sharing with you, well, I'll tell you about it later, but in the meantime, we were want to have some singing here. we got some young ladies here who are going to be singing, and then after that, I'll introduce the sermon. But let's ask God's blessing first. Father in heaven, we thank you for each one who's watching by YouTube and watching over Facebook and each one who is here today. Please anoint the service, the speaking, the singing. Open up our hearts and minds to understand this great message that you have for us today. And both the sermonette and the sermons today, Lord, let them be a blessing to us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, without further ado, I want to ask uh, our young ladies to come up here. Miss Rachel and... Like Hayla. Oh, is that what you were getting ready to say to me? I thought she had a question. No, I'm just standing. I was just standing. <laughs> and and <laughs> Miss Kayla. Business. I'm, yeah, I'm just standing here. Mind Miss my own Lake business. Miss Kayla and Miss Rachel, <laughs> they'll come up here and we'll let them start. No, I was standing up so that I could get the music started. Next uh, week, uh, we're actually going to, we've got a new song that we're going to be singing. If we can get together and practice it, we've got, I already got the lyrics for it and got the melody for it. And uh, so it will get together and practice that. So next week, we've got one that may even be easier to sing than this one. Uh, so anyway, please be with us. Please be with us for next week. Anyway, without further ado, good to see everybody here. Uh, I'd like to introduce, not introduce, so you've already been introduced, but present to you the uh, a gentleman who uh, has been with us for, oh, I don't know, years. I forget when he graduated. What year did you graduate with your, uh, depending on what degree you're talking started about. started in 09. Started in 09, so it's been a while with us. This is our, we just completed our 19th year here at the college. So anyway, I'd like to present to you 
Dr. Christopher Burse. Good morning and welcome to today's Sabbath service. Um, I had to think about that. Uh, had to work that out when you said, when did you graduate? I had to remember we, we passed over a year and then this was like 2013. So anyway, um, I hope that all of you spent some time during Passover week going over the passages of scripture, which Dr. Slough gave us concerning the keeping of Passover. If you missed any of those services for whatever reason, uh, please go back at your earliest convenience and watch them. As we know, leavening depicts sin, depicts sin in the symbolism of Passover. And Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that Christ is our Passover and he sacrificed for us. He then says we should keep the feast. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 6 states that you shall eat unleavened bread seven days. Ye, in this instance, are those who are keeping the Passover. It's all of us. As Dr. Slough so eloquently put it on the first day of Passover, abstaining from leavening this week symbolized an abstinence from sin. Likewise, the partaking of the unleavened bread symbolized partaking of righteousness, not which we possess by our own abilities. Instead, it's the righteousness which has been imputed to us. We do this for the full seven days in order to symbolize perfection, as it is written, Be ye perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. So understand that you're in a covenant relationship with Christ. He has taken on your sin and given you his righteousness, which was unattainable through your own strength of will. You receive it by faith. Notice that God calls things that be not as though they were, Romans 4.17, right? Just as he entered into a covenant with Abraham, calling him a father of many nations, so has he done with us, calling us righteous. Now, has Abraham attained that status, being a father of many nations after all these years? Indeed, he has. And thus, we will also attain that righteousness. If we'll keep the covenant, walking after the Spirit, following after righteousness, now that Christ has saved us from our sins. There is a place in the King James Version of the Bible where the translators felt the need to place an opposing corollary statement. Now, you're like, what the heck are you talking about? So let's take a look at this. This is in 1 John chapter 2, verse 23. Let me give you a little bit of time to get there. Um, so 1 John chapter 2, verse 23. And uh, we read the following statement from John. He says, Whosoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. Okay? Now, the translators added a statement, because it's all in italics after that, right? The translators added a statement which agrees with what, what John says, but it's approaching it from the opposite direction. It says, but he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So it, it's, it's giving us the same principle. It's just taking it from a different angle. And what we find is that there are quite a few places in Scripture where if we decided to place an opposing corollary statement like that next to the sentence that we read, it would show us some very harsh realities. Like, for instance, um, John chapter 14, verse 15 says, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? So if we refuse to even make the attempt to keep his commandments, what are we telling Jesus? Our actions are stating that we do not love him. Okay? Now, my mother used to tell me from when I, when I was a child that actions speak louder than words. Okay? Now, recall the scripture, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. It's quoted by Jesus when addressing the Pharisees for their keeping of traditions in, in Mark chapter 7. If we, if we cast aside the commandments, we're showing Jesus that we, we don't love him. It's just, it's a harsh reality, but it's true. So this is very important. It should be important to each and every one of us. I mean, you've seen me up here before. You can probably say the words with me. 
you know, we should always strive to be better Christians today than we were yesterday, better Christians tomorrow than we are today. And this, it's always going to require effort on our part. And as we make the effort to keep the commandments, whatsoever God asks of us, what we're doing is we're showing our Lord and Savior that we love him. So finally, why are these holy days important? Most of the Christian churches don't have anything to do with them. Most often disingenuously referring to them as Jewish holidays. And if they're reminded that Jews, in fact, made up only one of the 12 tribes of Israel, some will double down on the faulty logic and say, well, when we say Jew, we are referring to all 12 tribes. And if you do that, you make an absolute mess of the books of the prophets. It's ex completely and extremely faulty logic, but that's a subject for another time. Concerning these holy days, let's take a quick look at Exodus chapter 31, verse 13. I'm taking it from one end. Probably, you probably should hold that place in, in 1 John, but uh, go back to Exodus 31, verse 13. God is speaking to Moses. In verse 12, it says, you know, the Lord spake unto Moses, you know, saying. And in verse 13, he says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies you. So when you keep the Sabbaths, and that's plural, not just referring to the weekly, Remember that it is God who has given you the knowledge and the wisdom in order that you should desire to keep them. And in doing so, he has sanctified you. He has set you aside from all the peoples on the earth to be his peculiar people who will follow him wherever he goes. And when you first begin to keep these days, you might do so because you're convicted that you should be keeping them, or at least you just want to see what all the fuss is about. What's the big deal about all this, right? But as you continue keeping these holy days in the weekly Sabbath from year to year, they actually become a part of who you are. They become part of your identity. God has sanctified, set you aside for his purpose. Now, when I first started keeping these days, it was because I wanted whatever reward God wanted to bestow upon me for my obedience and be called great in the kingdom of heaven because I had read Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. You know, so. But after having done this for over a decade now, I'm still willing to accept whatever God has for me, but I'm, that's not why I'm keeping these holy days. It's not about the reward. It's because this is who I am. This is me now. This is my identity. I can't avoid the holy days or skip the holy days and be true to who I am. Now, if you're here now, today, you do well. But please make certain that you don't stumble because the times become more challenging every day. Jesus warns us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which you have, that no man takes your crown. Well, now, how can that crown be taken? Very easily. Though he will never leave or forsake us, what do you suppose happens if we leave or forsake him? If we simply stop or refuse to make the effort to do the things which he says the whole time calling him Lord. I know I went over this a couple of weeks ago. You may recall that question that Jesus posed. Why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I say in Luke chapter 6 verse 46? And then immediately he goes into the parable about whether the house is built upon a rock and can withstand the storm or it's built on sand and it falls. Understand, if you refuse to make the effort for God, your foundation is sand, your house will fall. Not because I say so, but because Christ said so. Okay? And that is why I'm always up here exhorting you to be better Christians, simply because, like myself, I, I think we all have room for improvement. You know, we, we're, none of us are perfect. So we, we need to keep making the effort to be just a little bit better all the time. Now, you can ignore this, and you can say, hey, this guy's completely off base. And if you do, I, I'm not going to judge you for that. Uh, Jesus said that one would be your judge in the last day. And he said the word that he spoke would be your judge. Now, how can a word be your judge? Very simply put, 
you're going to be judged according to whether or not you received the message which Christ preached. Mm -hmm. And now, have you received it or have you rejected it? And now the question is, you know, it, that, that seems too easy and it's too quickly answered. But consider John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, where Jesus says, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Remember, we were talking about those opposite corollary statements. Consider the negative of this. If you do not continue in Jesus' word, then you are not his disciple. You're not going to know the truth. You'll probably believe a deception. And the truth can't make you free because you don't know it. But the deception will, in fact, enslave you. So we want to make sure we're always following Christ. Make the effort. I know that that is a very harsh thing to say, but listen, we don't have time to mess around with this. There, we're getting attacked on all sides. All you got to do is pay attention. So now somebody's out there thinking, though, <laughs> listen, Jesus died for my sins. He's never going to leave me or forsake me. I don't have to worry about this. I don't. I don't. Okay? I don't have to worry about what you're saying right now. I don't have to listen to you. And you're right, you don't. You don't have to listen to me. I mean, let's face facts. There's no book of Christopher in the Bible that you should pay attention to what I have to say, right? Instead, I'm going to ask you, would you listen to the disciple whom Jesus loved? If John, the son of Zebedee, had a word for you, would you listen? Okay, so let's turn back to 1 John chapter 2. And I'm just going to begin in verse 3. John says, And hereby we know that we know him, meaning Jesus. We know Jesus if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know Jesus and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keeps Jesus' word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that says he abides in Jesus ought himself also to walk, even as Christ walked. Okay, and if you were actually reading that along with me, you're going to go, it says, there's a lot of he's and him's in there. Yeah, and, and to try and simplify it, that's where I've like inserted who he's talking about when he says he versus him, the individual versus he being Christ. So John has, in that passage right there in verses 3 through 6 there of chapter 2. He's given us no wiggle room. If we claim Christ, we ought to be making the effort to be as he was while he was on earth and even as he is now in heaven. It's past time that we get the idea of being saved and satisfied out of our heads. It's time to take up your cross and engage in the discipleship of Christ. Therefore, put aside the things that you can't prove by Scripture. Reject the traditions of man where they do not line up with the Word of God. Strive to learn the discipline of being a Christian. And finally, be the best disciple of Christ you can possibly be. So in that day of judgment, you'll have nothing for which to be ashamed. Thank you, and may God bless all of you. That, that was a blessing, absolutely. Is that crooked? Because it, it looks, looks crooked on my laptop. It looks okay. okay. Yeah. That was a blessing. I appreciate that very much. And it goes right in with what I'm going to talk to you about today. I want you to listen. What's so funny? What I missed? It's just, you said it, it, it rolls right in with what you were saying. It's not like we talked about what we were Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, we pray for God to inspire the services, and sometimes the messages. I heard a true story one time. Uh, this man from uh, Texas was giving the sermon, and the man from New York was giving the sermonette. And they hadn't even talked. They had, I don't know if they even knew each other. And, of course, they prayed for inspiration, and they were going to speak at the Feast of Tabernacles one year. And so the day, of course, that's a week-long festival. So the day they spoke, the man who got up and gave the sermonette said, I, I want to conclude my sermonette with this short little poem here. And he read that little poem. Nobody thought anything about it. The man who from Texas who got up to give the sermon, he said, you won't believe this. 
Here's that same poem. I was going to read it in my sermon. <laughs> it was from Edgar Guest. I remember that so well. But that happens sometimes. But it's, you know, is that just a coincidence? Or, you know, God inspires messages many times, so we must believe that he will. What I want to share with you today, I've written something on the board for those of you who have studied Greek, and you can all read it, of course. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Ekate Piston Theu. Now, my, uh, I'm going to be talking to you today, if you want a title for this message, it's the faith of God made easy. Here's the problem. Jesus said, if you have the faith of God, you might say to this sycamine tree, be plucked up and be by the roots and be, you know, cast away and he'll obey you. Okay, if I had the faith of God. If you have the faith of God, who's, I, truly, truly, I say to you, if you have the faith of God, you'll say to that mountain, be removed, and, and it will obey you. Yeah, yeah, if I had the faith of God. <clears throat> I'm going to show you today, it's easy to have the faith of God. Now, I have never shared this message in church. In all these years, I've never shared it in the classroom this is new revelation that God has given me over the last three months. I've been really studying it for the last two months. And so, like I said, if I don't finish it today, we'll finish it next week. It's that important for you to hear. <clears throat> Why is it important? Because as Chris was saying, you know, we're getting close to the time when all these things are about to happen. Let me share with you just two things in the news, just two quick, very brief things in the news. I heard just yesterday, economists are now saying that our economy has shrunk this year by 1.4%. And experts are now saying that a recession will be here by next year, and it may even start late this year. A recession is first cousin to a depression. And when people are out of work, people are going hungry, and uh, it's, that's not good news. Recession is bad. For those of you who remember any past recession, it's not good for the nation. It's very, very bad. So because... And you'll remember 16, 17, 18 months ago, I predicted when they were talking about the election, I said, I said, if Joe Biden is elected and if he fulfills his promises, which by the way he has, but if he fulfills his promises to spend all this extra money, where's that money coming from? We're $29 trillion in debt. Where's the money coming from? They simply go and they print it on the printing press. But when you take 100% of the money that's out there in the market and then you print more money, that makes the money that's out there less worth, worth less, less value, which is what we call inflation. Now, you learned this in high school. And so he wanted to spend, what was it, $6 trillion, I think? The Republicans wouldn't accept that, but he, he wanted to spend all this on the, the Green New Deal and all this. If you start making all these projects and you start throwing trillions of dollars, what's going to happen is it's going to cause inflation. Now, we all knew that. We all knew that. And yet 80 million, whether it's 80 million Americans or not, whoever it was, all these millions of Americans said, yep, that's what we want. So they got it. So I don't want to hear anybody complaining about that now that they got what they wanted, what they asked for. So the, the, the economy is, is hurting. And now I just heard, and you, so have you the last couple of days on the news, they're wanting to go ahead and pay student debts, just, just write off those loans. You don't write them off. Those professors are not going to say, okay, I won't take any pay for my teaching. Those universities are not going to say, okay, we won't take any tuition. That's not how it is. The government pays it. Where's the government get their money from, by the way? Us. You. Now, there are two ways to get money out of the American people. You can tax them, or you can simply make up money, and that's inflation. And, of course, if you remember this from high school, inflation is a secret tax. Inflation is a government tax. We won't spend any time on that, though. But I just want to share with you, as we get closer and closer to the time of the end, the day is going to come, and I didn't make this up. I got this out of the book of Revelation. It will take a day's wages to buy a loaf of bread. Now, what is a day's wages? It used to be $100 a day. It's more than that now. It's close to $200 a day. National. I'm talking about not close. It's not exactly. I think it's something like... 42,000 a year or 45,000 is the average salary in America today. So if you average that out, it's, it's less than $200 a day. But still, that's a lot of money, even $100 for a loaf of bread. So you're going to have to decide, do I buy bread or do I buy medicine if you need it? So things are going to get bad. And Revelation predicts that. You and I, however, can escape all these things that shall come to pass. 
That's Luke 21, 36. If we will obey those four things Jesus told us to do. Now, one of the things he's told us to do, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. One of the things he's commanded us to do is have the faith of God. And I wrote it up here. Ekete pistan thuu. Now, every single English translation I have checked has, has mistranslated that. Because that does not say have faith in God. Even the King James says have faith in God. The Greek says have the faith of God. And I wrote it on the board because I want you to see. See that letter U? That's the letter Upsilon in Greek. Anytime you see, Now, this is the name for God. T-H-E-O-S is usually the name for God, Theos. But this is Theou, which means of God. It means of God. Have the faith of God. Well, why didn't they translate it that way? Because it didn't make any sense. What do you mean have the faith of God? Nobody can have the faith of God. So they mistranslate it as have faith in God. That's something you can do. We're going to have to learn how to have the faith of God to get through the next few years. And I won't go back into the 40th Jubilee and all that, but if that does happen, and if Jesus does come back, the tribulation, remember, comes first. We better learn how to walk in faith. Also, I just heard uh, yesterday on CBN, which is Christian Broadcasting Network, they said that Russian's um, foreign minister, Putin's foreign minister, said just this week now, just this week, these words, quote, the risk of nuclear war is real. That's the first time that's been talked about since 1962, since the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the point I'm making is, brother, we better learn to live by faith. We better learn now. Because you might say, oh, I don't need faith. I'm, I'm, going, I'm already storing up food. Man, I got this basement, and I'm going to store up food for three and a half years. I'm not going to starve. I won't take the mark of the beast. Well, wait a minute. Have you told anybody that you're storing up food? Oh, yeah, a few friends. Uh-huh. And those friends aren't going to starve. When they find out that you're storing up food, they're going to tell their, well, they can't let their brother or sister starve. And they can't let their children starve, so they're all going to show up at your house when the tribulation starts. So you saved up food for three and a half years, and by the time we all find out where your house is, that food might last you a week because we're going to eat all of it. You see what I'm saying? You can't depend on, well, I'll store up food because as soon as everybody else finds out you've got it, they're going to come to your house. Now, somebody said, well, I'll just take a shotgun, and when they try to break into my house, I'll shoot them. That was in a... Outer Limits episode back in the 60s, or maybe it was a Twilight Zone episode, where this man had a shotgun, he was going to shoot everybody, but then he had to come to the realization, can I shoot my neighbors? Can I shoot my relatives? And, and so what do you do? And I'll tell you, here's the answer. Learn to have the faith of God like Jesus said, and Jesus said you can escape all these things. If you'll do those four things mentioned in Luke 21, 36, and Revelation 3, 8 uh, through 10. Now, all right, now let's get into this message. I'm going to turn to Mark 11, 22. The King James says, have faith in God. Now, I want to back up to verse 12. Why did he say that? Actually, he said, have the faith of God, as I said. Because verse 12 says, Jesus was hungry and he, he saw a fig tree out there, so he came to see if there was anything on it, but he found nothing but leaves. So Jesus, in the presence of his disciples said, no man eat fruit of thee. Now notice he's talking to the tree. Hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. They went to Jerusalem, and he, this was the second time this had happened. He overturned the, the, the tables of the money changers, verse 15, the seats of them that sold doves, and so on and so on. And then verse uh, 19, and when the evening was come, he went out of the city. He went out of Jerusalem. Now the next morning, verse 20, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Jesus didn't say one word about that tree. He didn't even look at the tree. Let me tell you what he did. He and the disciples are walking down the road, and there's the tree right over there. And Jesus is walking on to wherever he's going. He's not even looking at that tree. But now he's got 12 men behind him. They're all walking around looking at the trees and the birds. And all of a sudden, Peter sees that tree. And he calls it out to Jesus' attention. Look, that tree yesterday. You, you, you put a curse on that tree. Look at it. 
So then Jesus looked at it. But he had not looked at it until Peter brought it to his attention. Verse 21, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. Now, there are two ways to answer something. You can answer a question or you can answer a comment. A question is, you know, explain such and such or, or please, you know, I, I want to ask you about such and such. But you can also answer a comment. For example, if you say to me, man, I really like that, that new car you're, you're driving. And I might answer your comment by saying, well, go down to the XYZ car lot, implying that's where you get one like I'm driving. Or I really like that dog you've got. You don't ask me where'd you get him. You just say, man, I really like that dog. Well, go down to the animal shelter down here. The answer is in response to what you said. So Peter says, hey, look at that fig tree. It's withered. Jesus answered that comment by saying, here's his answer, verse 22, have the faith of God. How is that an answer? Well, if you say, boy, I sure like that dog. I wish I had one like that. What you're saying is, how can I get one like that? So I answer you. I wish I had a car like you've got. How, how, what you're actually asking me is, is, how do I get one like that? So I answer. Peter said, wow, look at that fig tree. Jesus said, Peter, have the faith of God. What's he saying? He's saying, you can do the same thing I did. Have the faith of God. That's how I did it. Now, that's Mark 11. Now, Matthew, it's good to read all four Gospels because Matthew will say more than Mark, and then sometimes Mark will say more than Matthew. So you want to take the accounts together. The book of Isaiah, I'm going to Matthew 21. Isaiah says the, the word is written here a little, there a little. You put it all together like a puzzle. So here's what it says in Matthew 21. Verse uh, 20, the disciples said, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Verse 21, Jesus answered. He said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and doubt not, that's the faith of God. See, the faith of God is not saying, I sure hope this works. The faith of God is to say it and know it's going to work. He said, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do what is done to this fig tree. You mean you and I can speak to a tree and make something happen that we either cause it to die or cause something to happen? I've got a fig tree out in my backyard. And ever since I started studying this, I've been looking at that fig tree every day, you know looking at. Well, I got one fig tree. And I'm thinking, I need to start imitating Jesus. He decreed things. He would say things and they'd come to pass. But I've only got one fig tree. If you have the faith of God, you will not only do what I did to the fig tree. But then he adds more to it. So let me read to what, what he said. But also, if you say to this mountain, he didn't say a mountain. Recently, someone told me, well, that wasn't a real mountain. He, he, he's talking about a mountain in your life. What if that big old real mountain is a mountain in your life and it's in the way? You shall say to this mountain, he's talking about a real mountain of rock, be removed and be cast into the sea. It shall be done. Wow. So Mark leaves out that part that you will not only do what is done to the fig tree. Now you say, why is this important? Because when the tribulation comes, dear me, we're going to have to learn to walk by faith. Where are you going to get your food? You say, well, I'll call you, Keith. You'll tell me. You're, you're, a, you're a minister of God. Surely God will tell you. He might tell me, but I may not be anywhere around. You need God to tell you where to get the food. You may have to find you a fig tree or find something. I don't know. How can you escape the mark of the beast? Now, I know this is all religion in the year 2022, but nine or ten years from now, this may not be religion. This may be reality. You may have to run for your life. You may have to flee. You may, you may have to go out and search for food and can't find it. Oh, there'll be grocery stores. Yeah, you can go into a grocery store. Uh, show me your, the mark that you've got there. Oh, well, I didn't get one of those. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, up in New York City, they wouldn't let people even walk into a restaurant until they showed proof of vaccination. The government is already getting people ready to have to show some sort of ID to prove what you've done or who you are before they let you in. So people in New York, they, they got in the habit of realizing, well, they won't let us in without taking that vaccine. The day will come when you won't be able to go into Food Lion up here or Harris Teeter or somewhere or your favorite grocery store and just go in there and buy food unless you can show you've got the mark. 
What's wrong with the mark of the beast? You have to identify with that mark. You've got to show allegiance to that mark over your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Polycarp was a disciple of John. He was ordained by John. He became the next chief apostle over the church after John. And he, he probably was in his 90s. He was at least 86 years old. We know that. Late 80s. He could have been, yeah, because he said he'd been serving Christ for 86 years. So assuming that he was even five or six years old when he became a Christian uh, or had started serving Christ, he was probably in his 90s. And they, they told him, they liked him. He was called the father of the Christians. They said, look, say Caesar is Lord and deny Jesus and you go home. Well, Caesar was Lord of the Roman Empire, but Jesus was his Lord. He said, no, I can't say that. Being an old man, they really didn't want to put him to death, but they said, look, you either have to say Caesar is Lord or we have to burn you alive. And Polycarp was willing to go to the stake and be burned alive before he would deny Jesus, which is what you were talking about in the sermon. He would not deny Jesus. And so they took that old man, probably in his early to mid-90s, maybe older than that. He'd been, he could have been close to 100. He said, they, they told him, they, they tied him to the stake and they had the wood laid all around to burn him alive. And they said, deny Jesus. And he said these words, and these are very famous words. He said, I, I have served Jesus for 86 years. How can I deny him now? So they lit the fire to burn him alive and according to the legend according to the history a wind suddenly came and blew the fire out and they looked at that and one of the soldiers took a spear and just went and killed him on the spot and then they burned his body then the wind left it alone so God didn't let that man burn up that spear killed him instantly and then they burned his body here he is, an old man, probably had grandchildren, great-grandchildren, but he would not deny Jesus. The day is going to come when your faith is going to be tried, and you're going to go to the grocery store, and you're going to, not going to be able to eat unless you take the mark. And that mark means you have to put your allegiance to the Roman system over and above your, your allegiance to Christ. Now today you say, I'd never do that. Wait, wait a minute. Peter said, I'll never deny you. And before the night was over, he denied him. Yeah, three times he denied him. Before the night was over, it hadn't even sunrise had, had he come yet. The, the rooster crowing, which occurs around 4.30 in the morning, the rooster hadn't even crowed yet. So we say, I'll never take the mark of the beast. Let me tell you how you can be guaranteed that you don't have to take the mark of the beast. You start practicing your faith. You start living by the faith of God. I don't mean just the Christian faith. I mean the faith of God. We're going to learn what that is today. Now, he, he said, have the faith of God. I'm back in Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Have the faith of God, which means the faith that God uses. For verily, and that word means truly, I say to you that whosoever shall say, say, that's interesting, not pray, say to this mountain. And you tell the mountain, Jesus spoke to the tree and it died because that's what he he said what would happen, or at least he said it would never bear fruit. If you say to the mountain, so what is the faith of God? It's making a decree. If you say to the mountain, be removed, and shall not doubt. If a person says that and does not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he will have whatever he says. It's not limited to mountains or fig trees. You'll have whatever you say. Job 22. I'm going to turn to one verse here. Job 22 and verse 28 says, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Now, I know that uh, in Job chapter 42, this is Job 22, uh, God told Job, you know, you're, these three friends of yours haven't spoken correctly. But yet Paul quoted this very man right here, Eliphaz, and he said, it is written, and he quotes it as the word of God. So what they said was true, but it wasn't true regarding Job. They'd say, you know, God's not going to bless sinners and so on, but they were applying that to Job. And what they said was true, but it didn't apply to Job correctly. 
So that's what the Bible is referring to. So you can read the book of Job as the word of God. So here's the word of God. You shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. You decree it. Tree, I say to you, you'll never bear fruit again. Turn around, walk off. And you got to believe that what you say comes to pass. And it'll happen. If you have chickens, by the way, I have a whole bunch of uh, cartons, egg cartons. If you know of anybody that needs any egg cartons, I've been saving them. Sometimes I've given them to people who will exchange them for a few dozen eggs. So, if you, you know, you got some, you know, I, I got egg cartons. How many do you need? Just you let me know after the service day. But I got them. I'll be glad to give them to you. Okay, I'm not selling them. By the way, do we have any questions over what I've mentioned so far? Or comments? All right, you decree it and it'll be done. What I was going to say about chickens, tell your chickens to produce eggs and they'll go on an egg laying spree. Use the faith of God. Maybe you're only getting a few eggs. Say, hey, listen, I need some eggs. I'm not taking the mark of the beast and I can't afford $100 for a loaf of bread. Chickens, I command you in Jesus' name, you start laying eggs. Watch them lay eggs. I finally figured out what to say to my fig tree. I went out there a couple of days ago, and I looked at that fig tree, and I said, you're going to produce more fruit than you've ever produced before. You're going to really produce figs this year. And it will. You decree it, and it will come to pass. What is it that you need in your life? You need your chickens to make more eggs. You need your cows to make more milk. You need something. Whatever it is you need, you decree it and do it in Jesus' name. God won't turn down Jesus for anything. What you do in his name, it's like you're doing it as if you were him. God won't turn down Jesus. And if you go in his name, he won't turn down you. Let's say that I have a, I'm well known at the bank and I've been in there, let's say, for years and years and all the people know me. And when, when I walk in, they smile, hi, Keith, how you doing? What can we do for you today? I want to withdraw $1,000. But today I can't make it, so I send you down to the bank. And, and, and I'll say, they all know me down there. Just tell them you're coming in my name. Tell them I want $1,000. Well, you'll still probably have to have my bank card or some way of making sure that you are coming in my name. When you go in my name, it's like you're going as my ambassador, as my representative, and they will do the same thing for you that they do for me. Jesus said, ask the Father in my name. He'll give you anything you ask. Ask the Father in my name. He'll give you anything you ask. Now, you just have to make a decision. To believe that. All right. Matthew 18, 18. I won't turn there, but here's what it says. Whatever you bind on earth, whatever you decree, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, where are you? You're on the earth. Where's God? He's in heaven. So maybe it's the mountain. <coughs> the mountain's not in heaven. The mountain's down here. But whatever you bind or loose here, God from heaven will bind or loose it from up there. Now that mountain doesn't have ears, but it will obey you. When Joshua told the sun to stand still, he decreed it here. He bound the sun from the earth. God bound it from heaven and the sun stood still. Now the sun doesn't have ears. The sun couldn't hear Joshua. I'll tell you one thing. The sun sure could hear God. Now let me tell you, before I tell you how easy it is to have the faith of God, first of all, let me tell you why it's hard to have the faith of God. I'm going to be honest with you. I've never been an alcoholic. I never had a problem drinking in my life. But I have heard one thing. If you want Alcoholics Anonymous to help you, you, you first of all got to admit you are one. A lot of people say, I'm, I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> but they are. Before they can help you, you first of all have to acknowledge you are an alcoholic. And once you say, okay, I do have a problem, now they can help you. Let me tell you why it's hard for us to have the faith of God. Because we know that the Bible says we're supposed to have it. We also know we don't have it. And so we're trying to make it happen. And we're trying to have the faith of God. And, and we're trying to be able to have the faith to move mountains. We're, we're working so hard. But you know what you know inside? <laughs> Let's be honest. If this were a room full of drunks, <laughs> I'd say, just admit it. You got a problem. So let's be honest with ourselves. The truth is, and we know this to be the truth, deep down inside, we don't want to admit it at church because we don't want other people to think we're without faith. But let's just be honest. You know you can't move a mountain. Now, don't get up and walk out here and say I'm a heretic. Let's be honest. You can't move a mountain. You know you can't. 
You also know you can't walk up to a tree and talk to it. And it hears you. Trees don't have ears. So first of all, before we try to have the faith of God, let's realize, first of all, we can't do anything. Now, that's not an insult to you. A human being can't move a mountain, not without dynamite. Yes, ma'am. How do you do that? How do you get the faith of God? That's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I'm glad you're asking that question because that's what I'm going to talk about. Today. How to get it. How do you get the faith of God? I'm to, the name of this sermon is The Faith of God Made Easy. I'm going to show you it's easy to have the faith of God. But the first thing you have to do to have the faith of God is first of all acknowledge you're just a human being. You're not supernatural. You know, a lot of people went to Oral Roberts because, wow, if I could just get to Oral Roberts, I'll be healed. But Oral Roberts would have told you he didn't have, he couldn't heal a flea with a headache. A lot of people will just, if I could just get to this person, I'll be healed. We can't do anything. Now, before I insult you, let me just remind you. Let's see if I've got the scriptures. Yeah, I'm going to give you the references. I won't turn to them for time's sake. But here's what Jesus said in John 5.30. He said, of my own self, I can do nothing. And then he goes out here and walks on the lake. He walks on water. Now, is that a contradiction? He said, of my own self, I can do nothing. So let me just be up front with you. You can't do anything. Of your own self. You can't walk on water. You can't move a mountain. You can't speak to a fig tree. If you can't heal the sick, you can't do anything supernatural. Now, you can do a certain amount of things in the in the human sphere. Yeah, you can drive a car. I drove my car over here today, so there are certain things that I can do. But when it comes to the supernatural, like Jesus, of myself I can do nothing. Now, the scripture is like a puzzle. You want to put all the pieces together. John 14, 10, the last part says, The Father in me, he does the works. Now, put those two verses together. Put John 5, 30 together with John 14, verse 10 together. And here's what he said. Of my own self, I can do nothing, but the Father in me, he does the works. When Jesus spoke to the fig tree, he had no power to cause anything to happen. But God does. <clears throat> Let me tell you how easy it is to have faith. I'm, gonna, I'm introducing this. I'm going to have to finish it next week because I'm, I'm only on the first paragraph here and I've got a page and a half here to give you. This is very, very important because if the tribulation does occur within the next 10 years, we're going to have to learn. Don't come here to be entertained. Come here to learn. We're going to learn how to walk by faith. And I'm still learning. I've been studying this for a couple of months now. And I wanted to wait till after Passover to give it because it is so deep and profound. And I wanted to give this after the Passover is already over. Now let's get into this. All right. Let me share a verse of Scripture. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. Then next week we'll get into it thoroughly. But the answer as to how easy it is to have the faith of God is found in one verse in, of all places, the book of Lamentations. Now I know I've quoted this Scripture before in church, but I want to put this together and make it where it's, it's very understandable, very, very clear. You know, the guy that made, I don't know how much money he made on that book called The Prayer of Jabez. Y'all may remember that from, what was it, the early 1990s? Any of y'all ever heard of that book, The Prayer of Jabez? You've heard of it? You've read it. Did you like it? The guy that wrote that book, what was his name? Wilkerson, I think it was. Wilkinson. Wilkinson or Wilkerson. He was reading along, I think it was in First Chronicles, but all these begats, 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 and a lot of people just scam right over that. He found one little passage there about Jabez prayed and said, Lord, enlarge my, 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 my boundary or my border, and God did. And then he goes on with the begats. Right in the middle of all these begats is a gem that he made millions of dollars off of. He found that one little gem right there in the Bible, wrote a book on it, and people went crazy. It was a bestseller. You could have done that. But you didn't. Lamentations. Who reads that book? It's a dirge. And right smack dab in the middle of that book is a verse that tells us how to use the faith of God. It's Lamentations 3.37. And here's what it says. Who is he that saith, 
Now remember, we just read in Mark 11, he that saith to a mountain be removed, and if he believes all the things that he says, he shall, or saith, he shall have whatsoever he saith. All right, Lamentations 3.37 says this, who is he that saith, that's you, and it comes to pass. It really does come to pass. When the Lord didn't command it. When Jesus said to the fig tree, no man will ever eat fruit of you hereafter forever, that came to pass, didn't it? Who is he, including Jesus, that says something and, it, and then it really does come to pass when God didn't stand behind him and command it to happen? Let me tell you what happened. Jesus walks up to the tree. No man will eat fruit on you hereafter or forever. He turns around and walks off. God the Father said, die. That's what happened. Jesus told Peter, get out of the boat. Peter was going to drown. And God the Father said, walk. And he did. Let me tell you what the faith of God is. There was darkness, and God said, let there be light. And in the Hebrew it says, light be. But when he said that, it was dark. See, you may have a sickness. You may have a disease. Or some of you watching online and over Facebook, out of the group that watches, there's bound to be somebody that's sick out of a group here and, and on online or somebody that's sick, you can start, first of all, asking God to heal you, but then decree that you believe you receive when you pray. I didn't read verse 24, Mark 11, 24. When you pray, believe you receive and you'll have it. So you decree it, I'm healed. You say, yeah, but I'm not healed, I'm sick. It was dark when God said, let there be light. And there was no light when he said that. Why would he say it if there was already light? It was dark. He said, let there be light, and light was. The Hebrew says, light be, and light was. He looked at the oceans. Not a single fish was in the ocean. He said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. When he said that, there were no fish. Suddenly, there was fish. Let the land bring forth, and suddenly there were elephants and giraffes. You understand? He decreed it as... In other words, his decree is what brought it forth. Do I have a question online? Okay. Yes. Benita is asking, but what if you say it and it isn't the will of God to command it? Oh, that's an excellent question. What She said, what if you say it and it's not the will of God to command it? Um, the, the scriptures have to be taken together. The scriptures are here a little and there a little. And when you put all the scriptures together... We do remember 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, then he hears us and if he hears us, we got it. So <clears throat> you do need to make sure that what you're decreeing is within at least the general will of God. So you have to I, know that. Like if I see a man, like if I see Chris over there and I decree that I want Chris to be my new husband, be my husband that's not the Lord's will for me to have somebody else's husband. So I can decree it all day long. Yeah. God's not going to give it to me. Well, that means I will lie. She said she'll let you have him. See that? Um, <laughs> it's all right. Sorry. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> now I forgot what I was going to say. Decree things that are not coming to pass. Oh, yeah. Thank you. There's also the problem of witchcraft. Now, that would be a form of witchcraft where you manipulate somebody else's will. I am going to decree that they're going to get a divorce and so that I can have their, their spouse. That would be witchcraft. Um, that's wrong. You can't do that. And let me tell you, let me just bring this up. If God was going to force somebody's will, he'd change the devil just like that. Why does the devil rule this earth? Because... Thousands of years ago, God told Lucifer, all right, I'm giving you so much time to rule over this earth. And even when Lucifer rebelled and became the devil, God would not break his word to Lucifer. God won't back, won't change. But secondly, God could turn the devil's heart around just like that, but then he'd have a robot, wouldn't he? When God made you, he gave you with free, he gave you free will, he gave you free moral agency. The devil is a free moral agent. He can do anything he wants to do. And so we must not ever force our will on another human being. Ever. Ever. Look, if we could do that, why wouldn't we just decree that everybody's gonna be saved? I'll just decree, I believe all the world's getting saved by five o'clock day. But you can't do that. Yes, ma'am. Jesus, 
pray for your neighbors to come in. So how would you pray that in the right way? Can you please... Can you restate that? Because she's so soft-spoken that sometimes they have a hard time hearing on the camera. If you pray for your loved ones in the name of Jesus for their salvation. For their salvation. Yeah, all right. If they, if they want you to do that, then you're not forcing your will on them. But, I mean, I've had relatives to die that were die unsaved, and I tried to witness to them. But, but, but even when it comes to salvation... We know it's God's will to save them. First Timothy 2, 4 says, God will have all men to be saved. That includes your relatives. And it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God doesn't want anybody to perish. But it has to be their decision. God won't, won't even... Salvation is the greatest, most wonderful gift God has ever given to mankind. And God won't even force that on you. So where is the scripture proof that you can't pray against someone's will? Because that's what you said. Well... <clears throat> In Exodus, um, let's see, I've gotten it written down here somewhere. Exodus 22, verse 18, it says, Don't suffer a witch to live. And a witch, <coughs> witchcraft, <coughs> I've never bought any of these books down here at Walden Bookstores or Books a Million, but there are books, there are whole shelves on witchcraft. And what they do is they teach you how to, how to manipulate someone else's will to do your bidding. That's what a witch is, is somebody who who forces their will on somebody else. I mean, somebody might say, well, wait a minute. Now, if you believe in that healing, which I do, and I've given you many, many testimonies of, of my healings and of people that I've prayed for, Keith, why don't you go down to the hospital and just empty out the hospital? If healing is really for today, healing is for today, but they have to believe. And if you believe salvation works, well, let's go down and empty out the prisons. It doesn't work that way. They have to believe. So... You can't force salvation on anybody. How do you pray for them then? The first, that's a good question. The question was, how do you pray for them if you can't force salvation on them? Uh, Jesus said in Luke 10, uh, he said, pray that the harvest is great. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into the harvest. And so uh, somebody, you pray that God will bring somebody across their path that they will listen to. Uh, it may be you, but it may be somebody they used to know in high school. They may not listen to you because they don't think you know anything. They may not listen to me. Uh, they may not listen to a Christian, but they may listen to somebody else. I pray that exact prayer every day for two specific people. Yeah, so you uh, pray. So could I not pray for them to be receptive to the Spirit? Yes, yes. 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 Well, now John six forty four says God has to draw a person. You can pray and ask God to draw them, but you can't say, God, save them whether they want to be saved or not, because that won't work. So yes? Is that, is that what that means when it says do not suffer a witch to live? Yeah, anybody does that, they're, they're not worthy of living. They, so God you, put them I mean, to... Pray for them, right? Pray, pray for them, but, but if you try to force their will, that's witchcraft. One of the things that witches will do is use some of the very principles right here in the scripture. Mm -hmm. They believe that what they say comes to pass. But what is what makes it? See, there, it's almost like a, a thin line between witchcraft and the faith of God. The faith of God, but God believes that what he says comes to pass. So does a witch. But the problem is this. God won't force you to be saved, but a witch will try to force you to do their will. No, oh, that's right. That's right. They believe in the elements. They believe in yeah. crystals and things like that. I talked to a man just yesterday. I was returning his call. He'd been watching us. He may be watching us right now. Who'd been in Satanism for a long time. He grew up in it. And uh, so, but he finally got out of it and found Jesus. He's watching our videos now. But Satanism, they force, they, 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 they try to use the supernatural. I may go up and arm wrestle you to the ground. I'm forcing you to the ground. But that's not witchcraft. But to supernaturally, to use the faith of God to force you to do my bidding, that's wrong. Now, here's the, here, let me share one final thing. The tree has no will of its own. You can do anything you want to the tree. I can't do anything I want to to Chris. The mountain has no, no will of its own. I can tell that mountain, but I can't tell Christopher back here. Yes, sir. No, you, you 
if you want to see something where somebody's trying to force their will on another person, just write at that at that uh, same point where you were reading in Matthew 16. Uh, look at 16, 21, and 22, because Jesus says he's got to suffer uh, all of this that's going to happen to him. Uh, you know, he's going to be killed and he's going to be raised again on the third day. And Peter stands up and says, "Be it far from thee." Yeah, Peter says, no, no, we're not going to let that happen. He's engaging in that because he has just been told, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter's using that right there. Oh, I I don't want this to happen to you. No, no, that's not going to happen. He decreed it. Forcing his will on someone else. And what does Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. That's a very good point. Jesus told Peter, whatever you bind, whatever you loose, will be loose. So he said, okay, I'm not letting you go to the cross. Exactly. He said, get behind me, devil. Yeah. Okay, there's a question online. Yes, it's back up, we'll, back up a little bit. Um, Marie is asking, how can we know God's will in a specific instance? All right, how do you know God's will in a specific instance? Uh, the, the Bible is the general will of God. We learned that from Mark 3.35 and Luke 8.21. The word of God is his will. In a, in a general instance, it just has to agree in principle with Scripture. Like if, if I have two job offers, and this has actually happened to me, job A and job B, which one, both of them are offering me a job, which one do I take? Uh, Sometimes you pray, and if God doesn't lead you to take one or the other, flip a coin and go for one of them. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes, I wish God would speak to me audibly sometime and just tell me. And I think a lot of times, you know, if you want to buy, you got a car here, you got two cars, you can afford both of them, they both are great. But one's red and one's blue. So you pray, God, which one should I buy? The red one or the blue one? He's not going to be driving that car. Which one do you want? <laughs> Psalm 37, 4. He'll give you the desires of your heart. God says, which one do you want? Well, I'd kind of like to have the red car. Well, then you buy the red car. See, I hope that answers that question. We're out of time. And I'm just introducing this. So, so let me conclude by saying this. Luke 3.37 says, Who is he that says, when it really does come to pass, when God didn't command it? Do you think the son heard Joshua say, Son, stand still? 93 million miles away? You have ears. You couldn't hear somebody 93 million miles away. So we know the son didn't. So how did the son hear Joshua? It never did. But here's where we... Let me show you how easy it is to have the faith of God. And I'm not finished with this yet. You know God can move a mountain. It doesn't take much faith to believe that. You know God can make the sun stand still. You know God made the whole universe. So this is so simple. God can do anything. If you can get God to stand behind you and back up what you say, Matthew 18, 18, it will be so easy for you to have the faith of God because if you know that you know that you know that you know He's standing behind you and you know He is, then you can say anything you want to. You know it's going to come to pass. Now, next week, I want to continue this because I've only given you the first 25% of it. Please be back next week because it gets deeper, it gets more interesting, and we need to know how to live by this. Now, are there any final questions? There's a comment online. Okay. Uh, we have a comment, and then we'll yeah. conclude. Steve Harrison is saying, Dr. Slough, you are a truly gifted teacher. Thank you for sharing this teaching today. And then Benita said, I agree. And there's some likes to the comment. So, this apparently this sermon is really resonating with people so good good well I, I always pray I go to my prayer closet and I say God you know what the people need I don't what do they need and then I ask God to lay it on my heart what to share and I feel like this it was time to give this be all blessed this week everybody have a great week have a great uh, uh, weekend and hope to see all of you back here next week and uh Welcome all of our online people watching on YouTube and online. Please be back with us next week. God bless. We're dismissed.